everybody, I'm here with Professor Stephen Hicks. Uh, thank you very much for joining me. And uh, today uh, we are going to talk about something that's been of great interest to you um, and, and to myself as well, which is postmodernism and Nietzsche's relation to postmodernism, as well as a couple other topics that I'm excited to talk about. But before we get started, could you introduce yourself to anyone in the audience who isn't familiar with your work? Mm -hmm. And maybe give us a brief account of your journey through academia, why you were drawn to philosophy of, uh, out of all things. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Well, I'm a professor of philosophy at uh, Rockford University in Illinois. And uh, I also run a uh, teaching and research center focused on uh, ethics and entrepreneurship issues. But Nietzsche is a, a long standing interest of mine. I. Uh, I remember uh, I got my undergraduate education in Canada, where I'm from, and in my uh, my second course in philosophy, I actually hated my first course in philosophy and swore I would never take philosophy again. I had a very dogmatic, uh, weak professor, but my second uh, course in philosophy was good, and we read uh, Nietzsche's uh, Genealogy of Morals, and I found that fascinating. And from that, I was reading a number of other philosophers at the same time. So philosophy came together as a as a discipline for me. And uh, so I came to the U.S. for graduate school, ended up getting my my Ph.D. and my uh, my professor position here. So uh, yeah, I have written books on uh, Nietzsche and a number of journal articles as well and book on uh, postmodernism's intellectual history. And Nietzsche certainly is a part of that story as well. So here we are. Yeah. And uh, we decided to take a look at the first chapter of Beyond Good and Evil on the prejudices of philosophers. Yes. And I, I guess the first thing that I would say about it is I sort of see this chapter as Nietzsche psychologizing many of the great philosophers and philosophical ideas and asking, what is the drive that is beneath this idea, which implicitly or rather explicitly at the beginning involves a sort of challenge to what he calls the will to truth. Yeah. So do you see the seeds or maybe the germs of some postmodernist uh, ideas within that chapter? Absolutely. Um, yeah. Yeah, okay. for sure. So, uh, you know, a traditional conception of philosophy has been to say that philosophy is about the pursuit of truth uh, and uh, wisdom uh, with respect to what one does with that truth. And the presupposition there is that one has some agency, some capacity to think about issues, to sort out the true from the, the false, and then uh, some uh, agency with respect to one's own actions based on what one comes to take to be the truth. So the contrast there is to, uh, to, to unthinking people Right, and or people who are then uh, pushed around by forces beyond their control. It could be the gods or society or their parents or just whatever their passions are. So then, uh, uh, again, this is one conception of philosophy. It's a trend, a trend of working out what, uh, what are the truths and can we put them together into one overall account of the, the truth of, of the universe. Uh, typically bundled with that is uh, that the the agency is uh, the human capacity for rationality or reason. So you find this both in Plato and in Aristotle. You know, human beings are the, the rational animal. Uh, and so one mark then of being a philosopher in the true sense is being being uh, being rational, following the evidence, following the logic. Uh, when one has reached a conclusion, being governing by governed rather by one's rational capacity, not one's appetites or one's emotions, uh, or, or, or other kind of determining factors. So, fast forwarding then to Nietzsche in the 19th century, yes, indeed, one of the things that he is doing is uh, uh, overturning that conception of philosophy by going after the idea that uh, that truth is in some sense an independent or an objective value. All right, and that our capacity for seeking out the truth has any uh, independence. Uh, and so he's denying both of those. So he wants to, uh, in, in philosopher's language, reduce those to something else. So, yes. so then truth and the, the desire or the, the motivation 
or the, uh, the, the, the decision that I'm going to pursue the truth is not itself fundamental. He wants to say that that is driven by something else, something deeper that it can be reduced to. Uh, and, uh, and so there's, uh, and then the idea that we can, uh, acquire any sort of, uh, uh, objective or intrinsic truth that it speaks to us in any way. He wants to reverse that and then say that what we call the truth, and this is when we start using quotation marks around the word to distance ourselves from it is going to be, uh, somehow an expression of the subject. Right, or is going to be an imposition on whatever it is that is real out there. So he is or their uh, involuntary unconscious autobiography, basically. Yeah. Uh, so what that, that then uh, is going to uh, to be in Nietzsche's particular version? What is this deeper thing that he's going to say? Yes, we have deeper drives or deeper passions or instincts, and then he uses all of this vocabulary. And that's what is fundamental in operating below the surface, and it drives our apparent uh, will for truth or a decision for truth. But it's not an autonomous uh, uh, capacity that we are exercising. Yeah, well, and that ultimately he he will constellate all of those drives and impulses and, and instincts into will to power there are all sorts of different expressions of this yeah or that um we could say it's in it's in another passage i don't think in beyond good uh beyond good and evil but in his notes where he says that every drive has its own form of reasoning or own form of logic that uh yeah. or in zarathustra where he says the leading string of the mind's notions is found somewhere in the body in something physiological right. and uh unconscious so there's also a connection i think here to the psychoanalytic school, which is uh, fascinating, because they're yep. not usually associated with postmodernism, but you can see a very similar undergirding to their ideas that there's something perhaps less than conscious about, or a less than conscious origin of our conscious thoughts. Yeah, for sure. So what's important here? You know, Freud is born in uh, 1856. He's the, the the founder of the the psychoanalytical school. Nietzsche 12 years earlier. So both of them are uh, you know, smart guys who in their youth are uh, growing up in the age of uh, evolutionary theory. And then Darwin publishes Origin of Species in 1859. It takes the world by storm. So one way of reading those guys, both of them, is to say that they are reflecting on the philosophical significance of evolutionary theory. And what a crude version of evolution theory says is that before we were conscious and long before we were rational, we were organisms, you know, engaged in a struggle for survival. And so bred into us over millennia uh, and thousands of millennia are instincts. And so instincts are more fundamental. Consciousness is a superficial phenomenon that has arisen out of underlying forces and then so-called rational thinking is something even more superficially epiphenomenal that has arisen more recently so uh, so i think you're right to say that both of them want to take apparent consciousness and apparent rationality and reduce it to something underlying that is unconscious now then the differentia is going to be that Freud and the psychoanalytics are going to be universalist about that, saying that there is, you know, there's one human species and we all have the same unconscious instincts underlying us. And that might manifest itself in various in individual idiosyncrasies, but it's nonetheless the same generic forces operating across the species. So we can have a, a kind of universal science of psychology, which they then go on. Nietzsche is going to, and this is relevant to the quotation you mentioned a couple of years ago, saying that these forces are not universal to the species. You know, there are going to be different subspecies. And so human humanity might be too broad a label. It might be more like mm -hmm. other species that have subspecies. And in them, there are different kinds of drives that are operative and they manifest in different ways. And so, you know, this person's rationality, you know, it's superficial, the form it's superficial consciousness takes is different from the mm. superficial consciousness of another one. So there will be 
different value frameworks, different rationality frameworks, different accounts of what the so-called truth is. So the Nietzschean version pushes more strongly in a relativized direction. So I would agree with that. And I think you would probably agree post what we call postmodernism is generally seen as sort of a, a far left movement or leftist in its spirit. And yet Nietzsche, lar largely speaking, seems to me to be a man of the right, even mm. though he is an, a relativistic thinker. And I've been trying to put my finger on what the difference is. And I wonder if it's something like this, that it seems that the postmodernists, the people that would be influenced by Nietzsche in that relativist direction, people like Lyotard or Derrida or uh, uh, Foucault, Deleuze, seem to have a negative view of power. Whereas I think within Nietzsche's almost more purely relativistic system of thinking, it doesn't seem justified to have a negative view of power because if will to power is the constitutive element of all human action and you're going to need power to accomplish anything, morally condemning the person who has power doesn't seem to be justified under that framework because really you would just like to have power instead of that person. And yeah. so attacking the basis of will to power doesn't seem to make sense. And yet I, it seems to me that often that is the modus operandi of postmodern thought. And so yeah. it seems like there is a moral undergirding there. Yeah. Almost a moral no. use for this attack on mor moral objective reality. I don't know if you yeah. have yeah, a response. No, no, no. That, that, that's uh, well put together. But I, yeah, it, it puts together three uh, important elements. So the first part, uh, the part that we were talking about, is more the, uh, the epistemological issues. What do we think about truth? and objectivity and rationality. And if we go down the Nietzschean line and we explain those away as uh, uh, being reduced to non-rational, non-truth uh, drives and instincts and so forth, uh, uh, yeah, then that sets aside a certain conception of philosophy. And I think you were right then to say that the postmoderns do draw upon that epistemology in its subjectivized, relativized form. But then your second point then is to say, yes, that is, makes sense. But at the same time, postmodernism has a reputation for being a left-wing movement, right? Or a left inspired in its sentiment. And uh, what we do know of Nietzsche, when he speaks in a more social philosophy and political philosophy way, He's uh, nothing but uh, disdainful and scornful of anything on the left, right? So, you know, socialism is a kind of slave morality for him, and communism even worse, and uh, liberal individualism is just a watered-down right, version of them. And he explicitly says that he is in favor of a, a new kind of aristocracy, right, where, you know, there are... Uh, hierarchies, and some people are, in fact, better than others, and most people are a disgrace to the human species. So all of this socialist leveling and egalitarianism he sees as, uh, and, and he uses strong value language, disgusting, right, and so on. So uh, I think what we then have to say is that the postmoderns, uh, to the extent that that reputation for being on the left is accurate, they have to say that they are breaking with Nietzsche. And there, I think the story has to be more complicated because if you're looking not where the postmoderns get their epistemology from, which is Nietzschean and so on, but where they get their value orientation from, then when you read into them, uh, Karl Marx becomes very important. Jean-Jacques Rousseau becomes very important. So one crude way of putting... Uh, uh, the postmodern package together would be saying in its metaphysics and epistemology, it's Nietzschean, mm -hmm. but in its social philosophy and its value theory, it is Marxist and yeah. Rousseauian. And so it's a it's an algamation that way. Now, then the third very interesting thing is to say, uh, quite rightly, well, where does all of this value language actually come from? And how can we, if we, uh, how can we use it meaningfully and significantly if we have just relativized everything, right? So if we just say what you think is true, 
uh, is uh, is just a you know a subconscious projection of what you want to be true. Uh, then you can't really say that your value framework, including truth as a value, is objective in any way. It's just that that happens to be what you right want to be true, or your conception of the truth, or your value framework. So all of your sympathies and all of your activism uh, on behalf of one particular value framework is going to be relativized, and you can't say that it's any truer or better than any 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 other one. And I think that's exactly right. Uh, if you are a subjectivist and relativist in your epistemology, you do end up explaining away morality. And you know, to Nietzsche's credit, he is aware of this issue. A lot of times, he does use value-laden framework. You know, these people are disgusting and a disgrace to the human species, and so forth. And this is what a, you know a, a, a true noble human being will look like and do, and so forth. So he is using all of that value framework. But at the other times, he uh, typically uh, uh, and strongly disavows any moralistic language. So you know he wants to say that morality, for example, is just another prejudice. So he is aware of that, and he will say instead of using moralizing language about good and bad, good and evil, what we should do is use more biological language of health and sickness. So right. more moral language gets dismissed in terms of, you know, if you have this morality, then you are healthier. If you have this morality, by contrast, you are more sickly. And the idea here is that health and sickness are a little more objective or closer to the true. Right. And we are we are we're we're getting rid of that moralizing language. And I think to the extent that he goes down that road, then he is more consistent with his with his uh, with his reductionism. Now, the postmoderns, though, if they are people of the left. And again, this will be a cartoon short version of the left, which is to say right. We see the world as organized currently in hierarchical fashion. You've got the strong and the weak. You have the rich and the poor. And the relationship between those two is a matter of conflict, of the rich taking advantage of the poor, the strong taking advantage of the weak. And we happen to be emotionally on the side of the weaker and the poorer. Right? And that third part then where does that come from, right? And why would you then say that, say, we should be on the side of the weaker and the poorer? Yeah. And that's an interesting question. Whereas Nietzsche would be just the flip side of that. He would say, I am understanding the way the world works now in hierarchical form. There's the strong and the weak and the rich and the poor and so forth. And they are in conflict with each other and the strong take advantage of the weak, and sometimes the weak try various strategies to get together and overthrow the strong. But I, Nietzsche, happen to be on behalf of or feel an attraction right. to those who are stronger, richer, more powerful, and so forth. And then we would ask exactly the same question. Well, where does that uh, sympathy for or feeling identification for this side of it come from? And what both of them have to do is to say, well, that is a subjective preference. Right? It's right. rich versus poor, strong versus weak. They're in conflict with each other. And uh, exploitation is the story of the universe. And I just happen to be on the side, this side. And the other guys want to say, and that's the left side. And I just happen to be on the other side. And that's the right side. So it becomes a battle of wills or a battle of power. And that's where, again, both Nietzsche and the postmodernists would agree they say it is only just a power struggle. There is no right and wrong. It's a never-ending story of the universe. And they just then add their own subjective preferences about which side of the power struggle they happen to be on. So I that I think that was all really helpful for, for helping me uh, kind of tie together several things that I've been thinking about a lot recently with this. But I guess I would say just for me personally, I or I'll, I'll phrase it like this. If we take Nietzsche's critiques, say, seriously, perhaps the search for truth is not the main element of thought because there are other drives that are using that for their own ends. If that is the case, even if we don't want to go down the road of all the work that's been done in postmodernism, what does that do to the modernist theory of thought? I mean, do we go back to trying to salvage 
the modernist theory of thought. I mean, I know you, you, I, I read that you defended foundationalism uh, for uh, your doctorate. So I would imagine you would think there is something to the objective, uh, an objective standard of truth or some sort of universal standard of truth. Is that defensible in the modern world or is there something else? Like how, how would you deal with this? Right. Yeah, no, that's a very, very good question. So then the question uh, basically is what's the, uh, possible response to Nietzsche. And uh, it's fair to say that Nietzsche is one of the great critiques or criticizers of the modern project or the Enlightenment project. And then when the implications of that are worked out over the next generations, Heidegger, Foucault, Derrida, and so on, who are working within that framework, then the postmodern label comes to make sense. So then they're saying, we've worked out all of the implications of a Nietzschean critique of modernity, we put it all together in a package and say modernity is wrong, failed, faulty, we set it aside and we need to go post to, into, into something else. So then the question is, uh, if you think that Nietzsche is correct, uh, are the postmoderns right to say that uh, their particular direction, post-Nietzschean direction is the right direction to go? Or is the, uh, the the response to say, well, uh, there's another direction to go that's not postmodern, accepting Nietzsche, or does one as a philosopher have to engage with Nietzsche and say, well, what are his critiques of modernity, specifically, uh, in this case, the, uh, the, the epistemological critiques? Uh, so the concept of objectivity, for example, if Nietzsche is correct in saying that everything, say, is subjective, and that it's a subjective projection rather than a more objective receipt right, of reality, then we would have to engage with those epistemological issues. So then we would say, uh, as objectivists, as a small objectivism, a small O objectivism right now, a okay. standard story, right, is to say, um, well, you know, our senses respond to what's out there in the environment. And then we take our senses, you know, which we share with other animal species, but human beings then also are able to form abstract concepts. So we become a linguistic species with words that are abstract. So I'm a human, you're a human, and we're each perceptually quite different as human beings, but we also are uh, abstractly equally human in the same way. And then we take individual concepts. Uh, so then we need to have a theory about how this abstraction process forms in our, our minds. We take words and we put them together in sentences. And we see one-year-olds and two-year-olds learning this process. So then we need to have a theory of propositions and semantics and grammar. And then we take all of these sentences and we start putting them together in stories and we start uh, 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 telling narratives, and we start uh, constructing logical integrations of lots of sentences that we call theories of the way the world works, right? So mm -hmm. you know, an example I, th I think of here is, you know, when you're five years old and you go to kindergarten, you, know, you learn uh, water evaporates, and then it rises, and, and then it condenses and turns into clouds, and then it gets uh, uh, cold enough and then it rains and it falls into the stream and the sun heats it. And so there's this whole theory of the weather cycle that we learn when we're five or six years old. But that's a huge integration of 10 or 12 different sentences about how the world works. So we then need to have a theory of how sensation works, how abstraction works, how proposition formation works, how we tell stories, how we construct theories. And all of those have to work for the objective account of our understanding of the world to do. And that is a lot of work for philosophers to do. And that's the modern philosophy project. It's the Enlightenment philosophy project. And one response to Nietzsche just is to say, if we go through Nietzsche, Nietzsche is very systematic about that. He takes up all of these. He talks about concepts, about sensation, about propositions, about logic, and so on. And he takes all of the negative skeptical arguments that have been directed against them, and he thinks that those negative skeptical arguments work. So then the question is going to be, for post-Nietzschean philosophers and psychologists, is to say, well, was it just that you know the 
theories of, say, perception that Nietzsche was critiquing in the 1800s, uh, were those the best theories of perception or were those just early theories of perception? And like scientists, we say, OK, the skeptics have pointed out some weakness in those early theories, but now we know better how the brain works. We have better theories of psychology, so we have a better theory of perception. And we're not going to abandon objectivity with respect to, say, sensation. We're just going to do what scientists do, which is come up with better and better theories. Right. And the same thing with respect to abstraction. So when Nietzsche says concepts are just an imposition on reality, you know, there is no man, you know, that I'm a man and you're a man. There's not anything out there, you know, that that makes you a man and there's something out here that makes me a man. It's just a subjective theory. Well, whatever theories of abstract concept formation Nietzsche was critiquing in the 1800s, we have better theories now. And so the objectivity project is going. And the same thing for logic, the same thing for for grammar. But that's then the the debate that uh, small o right. objective philosophers and psychologists are engaging now with small s subjective philosophers and and uh, and psychologists. And probably the postmoderns are the most sophisticated in our time of the right. the, the the skeptical relativist ones. So so just to push maybe just a little farther on that because it's mm -hmm. it's like a almost a hobby horse for me at this point. Maybe there's something about the way in which even if we agree with everything regarding perception right but there's something that happens in the process of concept formation and particularly maybe in the communication or expression of concepts that i think nietzsche was on to something and this is really just an intuition speaking here that I think he was broadly correct when he says that the Socratic picture that we're, when two people are arguing, they're mutually trying to grasp toward the truth versus the sophistic version of that, that, um, you know, in fact, I think it's Thrasymachus expressed or maybe it's Callicles, um, that really both speakers are trying to impose their will on the other one. I think there has been some modern, uh, psychological research although for whatever stock we want to put into modern psychological research that it seems like the human brain is more oriented towards like winning in a lot of those mm. uh engagements i'm not ready to just discount that we can't be trying to find the truth but there does seem to be something really powerful to nietzsche's criticism that the all of these philosophical ideas are like an articulation of a power perspective or something like that mm -hmm. that at least that seems to happen very commonly, regardless of whether the person is a postmodernist or not. And like, how do we deal with that going forward, I guess? In the, yeah, the post no, that's another great question. So everything that we just said uh, about sensation and perception and uh, concept formation and so on, uh, it's hard enough to work that out as an individual, right? Just you looking at reality and trying to figure out how your mind is working and what the ways of using your mind are healthy and which ones are not healthy, which ones are more objective, which ones are, are more subjective. Uh, when you introduce uh, other people into the equation, we start having conversations with each other. Uh, we are friends or we are parents and child. We are teacher and student. Uh, we are boss and employee. Then it's not simply a matter of individual psychology, but there's a lot of social psychology that has to be worked out. And the question then is going to be for, again, small o objectivists, if we want to say truth matters, how does one uh, maintains one's commitment to truth in a social context? And it's quite right to say that, you know, in addition to being individual beings, we are social beings and what that means all needs to be worked out. But there do seem to be uh, elements of our social psychology that kick in uh, in that context. And some of them can further the quest for truth or objectivity. And some of them can be uh, uh, adversaries to the to the quest for for uh, for objectivity. So, uh, you know, for example, it's very easy once uh, we know someone has stated a position for that person to, again, setting aside other individuals just for the moment, say, I think this hypothesis is true. 
I made up this hypothesis. I feel good about myself for coming up with a creative hypothesis that might explain this phenomenon, right, whatever it is. Just as a matter of individual psychology, there's a lot of data that show people resist critiquing their own hypothesis. So if a new piece of evidence comes along, that requires more effort. And maybe there's a laziness component, right, or an energy conservation component. I don't want to have to go through that thinking process all over again. I like this hypothesis that I already made up. So uh, uh, figuring out how to uh, 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 realize that that's a danger that one has in one's psychology and to recognize when that danger is manifesting itself. Here's a new piece of data and I find myself wanting to just push it to the side, not mm -hmm. letting myself do it. So I've developed a kind of internal heuristic that says, Whenever I find myself ignoring something, I'm going to make extra efforts not to do that, to pay attention to the new piece of data and resolve that I need to incorporate this new piece of data in, in some way or, or other. And all of that, uh, uh, and there's lots and lots of other kinds of biases and obstacles in psychology that we need to learn about and then develop heuristics to, to deal with those. And there's a whole raft of them that come along in a social context. So... It's one thing for me, I come up with this idea by myself, and I think it's true. And then I tell you, I think this hypothesis is true. Well, I've gone public now. Okay? And right. my, yeah, my, <laughs> my, my reputation is mm -hmm. on the line. And it's hard enough for me to say to myself, I might be wrong about something. Right? Lots of data shows that it's even harder for people in a social context to say, I might be wrong about something. Because then it's not only that I have to pay a personal, psychological, reputational hit. I made a mistake and impose a cost on myself, feeling a little bit shameful or whatever. But I'm also going to have a social cost, right? You might very well say you're an idiot, right? Right? Or uh, you're stupid uh, because you announced that hypothesis, particularly if you've got good data that can do so. So all of that has to be uh, taken into account. And those are very real social psychological phenomena. So what the small o objectivist then has to say is not to deny that those aren't real psychological forces at work, but to say there are social obstacles to the pursuit of truth. People becoming defensive, say, when their ideas are challenged. And so part then of good epistemological education is going to be when you are thinking about difficult things and talking about with other people, you are going to be challenged. When you are challenged, there's going to be, say, a natural defensiveness that's going to arise up in your mind. Be aware of that. And when you are naturally defensive, typically these are the sorts of things that people do. They run away. They become insulting in turn. Right? Uh, they engage in ad hominem arguments and so on. So you go through the list of the kinds of standard things that people do when their ideas are criticized. Mm -hmm. Be aware of those things and be aware uh, and, 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 and develop a heuristic for yourself that when you find yourself feeling a certain way, you're not going to resort to ad hominem. You're not going to run away. You're going to learn how to deal with the criticism. So all of that has to be worked out as well. Now, what the subjectivists want to do, though, is to say that's impossible. That's 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 right. too big a project, uh, or it, it might be possible for you know the one in ten thousand people who are really dedicated. But for all practical purposes, let's just forget it. We are swamped by non-rational social psychological forces, and let's just forget about objectivity and just plunge into the social fray. If if we could bring in the the I think this would be the large or the capital O objectivists uh, briefly mm. because there's been a lot of uh, comparison between Nietzsche and Rand but I've always seen a, a gulf between them particularly on this issue. Yeah. Um, could you maybe compare and contrast Nietzsche and Rand's thought on epistemology and and where they they differ or where they're similar if you do see any similarities? Yeah. yeah. Well, that's a great question. Yeah, Ayn Rand, uh, you know, read Nietzsche when she was uh, young. Uh, uh, you know, it was part of her education, uh, she, growing up in in Russia and going to university in the, the Soviet Union days. Uh, she ended up being a. She was, I think, she was officially a history 
major because she knew she wanted to be a novelist. And so, you know, history is full of great stories that you can uh, uh, learn from and borrow yeah. from. But she also was uh, interested in doing philosophical novels. So Nietzsche was one of the ones uh, that she uh, she encountered. And and, uh, and so I wrote an article on this uh, where I focused mostly on their uh, their value theories, so their their uh, their ethics, their social philosophies as well. Uh, it's called Egoism in Nietzsche and Rand. And uh, uh, in that article, I, my conclusions are that when they are critiquing altruism, so when we read in Nietzsche, for example, that uh, altruism uh, uh, is a kind of slave morality, you know, the idea that I should be selfless and serving others and getting along with everybody and sharing all of my toys with with everybody else equally. Uh, uh, that altruist position or that strong altruist position, I think Rand did learn a lot from Nietzsche about it, and she agrees with significant portions of that. The flip side of that, their advocacies of egoism and individualism, uh, and we've not gotten into that very much yet in our in our discussion. At that point, you find that on their positive philosophies, they start to diverge and they diverge significantly. Mm -hmm. And then uh, to come directly to your question about the epistemology, one of the reasons why that divergence becomes so marked is precisely in epistemological issues. For Rand. The mark of being an individual that's going to undergird her understanding of human nature, her advocacy of egoism is to say, you know, not, not only that your life is yours as a value proposition, but what makes your life yours in part is that you have a mind that is under your control and you have the responsibility for exercising your mind, thinking about things, exerting the effort, making your own decisions. Uh, deciding your policies of action, acting in the world, and taking full responsibility for your actions in the world for for good or bad. Now that set of value consequences, right, comes out of a view about human nature that reason uh, is something that individuals possess, that it is powerful, that it is efficacious, and that it is volitional. It's under your control. And that's precisely where Nietzsche disagrees, because he wants to argue, this is the first half of our conversation today, that uh, there is no such thing as volitional, rational control. There is no such thing as agency under one's conscious control. So the idea that we are responsible for our actions becomes for him a myth. Instead, we are subject to forces below conscious level and our apparent agency is really by by other by other drives so at the well, metaphysics and epistemology they disagree fundamentally and that leads to huge differences in their value theory is that the basis of nietzsche's difference from rand regarding individualism like, is, do you see nietzsche as anti-individualist non-individualist yeah. how would you put it because i don't think he's yeah. quite a collectivist yeah um it, it's hard to, to classify him no, that, that's, a, that's a great question. And so I think we, we should first, though, ask, what do we mean by an individualist, right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so standardly, when the term individualism comes into use in the early modern world, is the idea that human beings are first and foremost individuals, right? You're not a member primarily of a family or you're not a member of a clan. Uh, you're not a member of a feudal caste, and that your identity is formed by the social relationships into which you are born. Then more systematically, that you are an individual because you have some sort of uh, um, rights as an individual to life, liberty, and that all individuals should have these rights. And underlying a lot of that is the idea that, again, individuals have agency. You have control over your actions, over your mind. And women have this as well, which is why uh, uh, individual rights for women starts to be talked about in the 1700s. Slaves also are individuals who have their own agency and, 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 and individual rights. So 
individualism then pushes in the direction of freeing all of the slaves as it does in the late 1700s and on into the 1800s. So all of those theses, though, Nietzsche denies. Right. So if that's your understanding of what individualism is, then Nietzsche starts not to sound like an individualist. And mm -hmm. this is where it becomes interesting, because at the same time in Nietzsche, he is celebrating certain individuals, right? So, you know, certain right. great human beings or people who have potential for greatness. You know, the uh, the the ones that Zarathustra is uh, is heralding, and so much of his rhetoric and and so I think some of the content does seem to be celebrating a certain kind of individual. All right. So, and this is where then we we have to be very careful. So, the first thing I would say though is, suppose you take Nietzsche's uh, uh, best human beings, the ones that he is calling for us to to become. Uh, how many people in uh, uh, in society do you think he thinks have that potential? One in ten million, maybe. Okay, so one yeah. in ten million. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Maybe a, maybe less than that. That's a fair. So suppose we take that number. That that would then be to say that nine million. 900,999 individuals Nietzsche thinks are worthless or right. maybe you know valuable as tools that can be used by that one in 10 million. Right. Now, what then would be the best label for a philosopher who says 9.99 .99 million individuals out of 10 million are worthless and have no value? Right. B and then Bona it's, it's, Bonapartist? I don't. Uh, yeah, or uh, <laughs> something aristocratic, right? Or monarchical, yeah. right? So we have other right. labels other than individualist. So if you're going to say the vast majority of individuals have no value, individualism isn't quite the right label. Mm -hmm. right? So, but then we have to then come back and say, well, what about that one in 10 million? And Nietzsche is pinning all of his hopes on that one in 10 million coming right. along and doing something special. Right, whatever that something special is, what we set that to side. Uh, so then we ask about that one in 10 million. Well, what makes that one in 10 million valuable mm -hmm. to Nietzsche? Now, Fate, destiny. Uh, okay. But I know those are, it's almost like you're just kind of <laughs> kicking, it, kicking it up a level, right? I mean, you could say in their instinct, their time and place. Yeah. What they have the ability to do and the fact, I mean, there's the one passage where he says, so many great men will be born like a Raphael without hands. There's a, yeah. a hundred ways they could be botched in some way. Yeah. You might have this amazing talent, but you know, you, you're Einstein, but you're born in the favela in Brazil and you know, something that's of right. that nature. That's right. Okay. So, so take that line. I think that's the right line to go. So it's, it's the fates, it's the forces, it's all of these other forces that have somehow come together and they're throwing out all of these experiments, right? Yeah. And one in 10 million of those experiments is going to be special. The Raphael yeah. with hands <laughs> and the right social, uh, social circumstances. Mm -hmm. Okay. So did that individual become special as an individual to say that I decided to become Raphael. I decided to work hard and develop my right. skills. And Nietzsche wants to say, no, the individual right. didn't do that work. It was all of these other forces that threw up. Or, or rather the, the fact that he works hard is something in his nature. That's right. That's yeah. right. So there's nothing individual about it. So the, the other people who are lazy, it wasn't their individual choice to be lazy. They just, that's the way they are. Right. So you are, again, even for that one in 10 million who is special, denying any individual credit to right. that individual for their being special. And so that's another cut at the, uh, the, the reputation. Now, then we say, though, instead of looking at the past, what made possible this special individual? What makes that individual special for the future? Right. And then Nietzsche wants to say something like the following. He says, what makes this individual special is that he elevates the species. 
he brings forth humans, uh, which are a species of a certain sort, and takes them in another evolutionary direction toward the overman. So he is good, if we can now use that good language, not for himself, but because he is improving the species. Now, if your value standard is what improves the species, what's right. good for the species, that is not an individualistic value standard. Right. It's almost, it's more collectivist than mo what we normally call collectivism in a way. Yes, uh, that's right. right. So we do have a label entire... for this. It's a kind of social Darwinism. It's a, sure. a slightly old fashioned label. So the idea here is that uh, what we want is we want to make the species stronger. And our analysis is all at the level of species. What will make lions faster or, or have you know, more mm -hmm. predatory? What will make swim uh, you know, fish more effective at getting oxygen out of water? So we want to improve the species. And we see Darwinism, the struggle between them, not as enhancing any individual's lives. And Nietzsche goes right down this road. He says, you know, nature, so to speak, is using individuals for its own ends to create a better species. And uh, the, the point that I that I argue is that, again, that is not an individualist standard. An individualist right. is going to say your life is an end in itself. You know, the and that would apply to of, Rand, right? And that's well. Rand. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Your life, your liberty, your pursuit of happiness. Uh, happiness is an end in itself. And Nietzsche is not that concerned with happiness. Uh, and he's right. not concerned with individuals being ends in themselves. The nine million, uh, the nine point nine nine million out of ten million, they are to be used as means to an end by the special individual. But that special individual is not special because of any individual things that he, or less frequently she, did. And he's also not an end in himself. He is for the improvement of the species, right. and that's Nietzsche. So. With all of those uh, uh, things that we just went through, and I think that was like three lines of argument, Nietzsche does have some very individualistic rhetoric, and I think a lot of us respond to him on that. But philosophically, he's not actually much of an individualist. I That raises a question for me, though, because if if we, and I get the sense you're in the camp of, of, of you're probably more in the camp of individual worth and uh, value, mm. but... It does seem to be, even if we set aside all of Nietzsche's uh, moral valuations about the species, you know, how often does somebody like Steve Jobs come along? Now, again, he might have a very particular set of circumstances. And somebody like Nietzsche would point out, which I think is kind of what maybe where, where my question is, yes, he worked his ass off, but how many people are built like Steve Jobs? There seems to be something... <clears throat> that was internal to him, that was just this drive that not everyone has. And when you look at the Pareto distributions or these various phenomena that tend to show, there are very few hyper-productive people who just have a, a fire burning in them. Mm. And it's very hard for me to square the circle of that being a sort of choice that they made mm. of how, what, what they would be like as people. Right. Uh, for, yep. for example, for myself, I work, uh, I would say I work my ass off on the podcast, but that's because if I don't spend hours every day writing and reading and uh, producing something creative, I'm not happy. I feel like the day has been wasted, but I'm not sure I chose. That's not a, like an intellectual calculation I'm making. It's almost mm. something I have to do in spite of whatever intellectual calculations I make. Like, well, I might really be happy. You're on, on the beach right now, but I don't know if I would. I don't know if I have that choice, right? Uh, right. So, what, yes. what is your reaction to that? Of yeah. uh, you know, Nietzsche's great man theory look, looked at from that light, I guess. right? No, that that's a that's a perennial issue, and it's a great issue. And you broke it down into like three sub issues during your your uh, your <laughs> outline there. So, so you know, if we take you as an adult, you know, given. Mm -hmm. The, the nature or the second nature that you have acquired, what's possible for you right now? Could you be happy, really happy, just becoming a beach bum, right? Is that within <laughs> the, uh, I'm just going to throw it all away and go lie on the beach and, uh, and, and do whatever? 
or is it uh, given the beliefs and habits uh, and whatever was born in you, you can only be happy by doing a certain range of things. So that's that's one one question. A related question is going to be, were you born that way? Uh, uh, and was everybody uh, born on a certain preset path uh, early on? So some people uh, had the Steve Jobs potential, and that might be a one in a million. Uh, but most people don't have the Steve Jobs potential. Right? Or is it the case that everyone is born with that potential, but say early childhood is decisive? Right, that uh, you know, certain things being encouraged or discouraged, certain resources being available or not available can take uh, a potential that's more or less equal among all human beings and make certain things possible or, or not. So there we're into the nature, nurture, and then, of course, the issue of the, the choices that people make, because then we get into the more fine grained argument where we say, you know, here are you know four kids and they were all born of the same parents. And so they're all coming from the same part of the gene pool, born in the same, uh, raised in the same household, went to the same schools, but they end up being four very, very different human beings. So mm -hmm. all of that, I think, uh, needs to be worked out. And so what we're learning in biology and psychology, I think we're still in the early days of working all of that out. So. That's two issues. You as an adult, what's possible to you? You as a child and all other children, uh, what's possible and how equal is the distribution of potentialities among those children? Now, the third question, though, is the value question, which is to say, as a philosopher of morality, does the difference, supposing that there were differences in human beings, does that make a value difference when you're doing, say, your moral philosophy? Right. Right. So suppose, for example, I'm a pretty smart guy, right? but I'm not, say, Einstein. And suppose that we were able to prove that as an adult, you know, Einstein was 2.3 times as intelligent as Stephen Hicks. Mm -hmm. um, would that change anything about my moral philosophy as an adult and Einstein's philosophy as an adult moral or what moral philosophy should, is appropriate. Should to Einstein get 2.3 times the rights that you have in That's society? That's right. He gets to vote right. 2.3 times and I only get right. to vote one time. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Now that would be one question. And, and I'm on the side of saying it doesn't really make any difference. Right. I, I need to be rational. I need to form my values and the same thing. Well, I need to be courageous and, uh, at various points, and so does Einstein. So it's going to be the same moral philosophy. Suppose we went back to birth and we said, all right, we analyze infant Stephen Hicks at one day, we measure his brain, uh, and we measure Einstein's brain, and we've got neuroscience all worked out. And suppose it turns out that, in fact, you know, Einstein has whatever uh, native intelligence that made him 2.3 right. times as intelligent as Stephen Hicks, All right? Uh, that's one possibility. Right? Would that change anything about the philosophy of how my parents say should try to raise me or mm -hmm. Albert Einstein's parents about how they're going to try to raise him? Or would they not say, you have your capacities, develop them, take control, form your values, you need to learn how to be courageous and get along and, sh and, and play with children well and so forth. Would this philosophy be the same, independent of that, say, native difference? Uh, and I'm on the side of saying, well, it wouldn't make any any difference. So even if it is true, and I just see this as an open question, that some people are born with more musical talent, potentially, or more mathematical talent, or mm -hmm. an adventuresomeness in contrast to being more of a stay-at-home kind of person. Uh, all of that will be very interesting to you as an individual. It will be very interesting to the psychologists and the social psychologists, but I don't think it's going to make a difference uh, for moral philosophy. Mm -hmm. Moral philosophy is going to say, whatever you're born with, right, use that to the best of your abilities, form your values, and so on. Awesome. Uh, Professor, thank you very much for, for joining me. Do you have time for one more short question? Yeah, let's do it. One more. This okay. is fun. Yeah. Uh, just where do you see the state today 
um, maybe within the academy, but just in the broader culture of this dialogue or, or conflict even between modernity and post-modernity and the way we think about morality, epistemolo epistemolo epistemological concerns, tongue twister. Um, do you think the culture is, do you see a movement there? Do you see one side uh, predominating the other? I mean, it's been very popular in recent years to say that everything is sort of overwhelmed by post-modernity. I personally mm. feel that outside of academia, I see more appeals to uh, modern or foundationalist forms of thought than, than ever before. Maybe yeah. as a reaction to that, but I just wonder how you, how do you see the territory today in 2020? Yeah, that's a really hard question because it requires uh, it, right. huge how, amounts of, uh, what's, of, of what of is your intuition? Your set tell yes, you, yes, that's right. Yeah. So, uh, primarily because I'm within the academic world, right? The, the, the data points that I get are going to be different from someone who's outside of the, outside the academic world. No, I think uh, we are broadly a, an enlightenment culture, that we are still very much a modernist culture. And I think even inside the university world, it's still mostly an enlightenment modernist culture. You know, the whole phenomenon of liberal education and taking education seriously and the vast amount of resources that we put toward that uh, is that... But it is true that uh, significant subcultures inside the academic world, most of them in the humanities, uh, uh, are dominated by postmodern. And some of the uh, organs of high culture, uh, like the, uh, the postmodern art world, uh, and some parts right. of the education establishment and so on. So you start doing the journalism there are more dominated. And I think they have been dominated, those subcultures, for the last generation or so. But I, at the same time, start, I'm starting to see a pendulum shifting uh, or changing direction, just because I think postmodernism and the more uh, virulent forms of it uh, was able to institutionalize itself because people weren't really paying attention to it, <laughs> mm -hmm. even inside the academic world. So... It, it grew, it became a significant minority position, uh, and then it was able to capture, you know, important departments and so forth, and then educate large numbers of, uh, of students who went out into other cultural forces. But I think eight, nine, maybe 10 years ago, there started to be a pushback. People started to be inside the academic world saying, hmm, something is wrong here, right? Those weirdos over in the humanities departments, um, they're getting a little out of control. Uh, we need to do something about it. So there was the beginning of a pushback by other academics inside the academic world. And so I think universities are in a process of engaging the debate and having lots of sometimes nasty debates about modernity versus postmodernity, the Enlightenment versus nihilism in some cases. Mm -hmm. And it's also spilled out into politics and other cultural fronts as well. So I see right now is the uh, the debate is now fully being engaged, and I think that mm -hmm. is a good thing for someone yeah. who is uh, an advocate of uh, again small l liberalism as I am and liberal education as I am. I think these debates have to be engaged, and to the extent that we do engage those debates, both sides get their hearing. The better side will prevail. Yeah. As long as there's a debate, that's a win for modernism, in a that way. That is why very often postmoderns <laughs> refuse to debate, and they go out of their way to shut down debates, to cancel, to subvert people, and so on. Yeah, they, they, I think they realize they cannot win the debates. Right. Yeah, it's, uh, it's unfortunate. But, again, that's good. That's good if there's a debate happening. Well, I've taken so much of your time. Thank you very much. Uh, okay. It's been a pleasure. And yeah, for me, um, too. Great questions. Great topic. Yeah, and uh, hope everybody enjoyed it. Um, where can, uh, if you want to plug anything that you're working on, or where can people find you online? Anything you want to uh, shout just out? Go to uh, stephenhicks.org. That's my uh, my website. And I also I mentioned uh, uh, CEE, my Center for Ethics and Entrepreneurship. We have a mm -hmm. YouTube channel. It's called CEE Video Channel. So we have lots of lectures and uh, debates and discussions and interviews that we post there for for more stuff. I have seen some of them. So, all right. All right. <laughs> well, thanks for Thank that. You. All, all right. right. Bye Same for now, Keegan. If you enjoyed the Nietzsche podcast or found it helpful, you can visit us and support the show at patreon.com slash untimely reflections. The link is in the description. 
or just share the show with any of your friends that you think might enjoy it or on social media. Thank you for your support.